share in either wisdom, story, or logic. And it's clearly amazing to hear all the different missing links discovered by people unique to their own journeys and in how they have come to discover them. Together, we can help to build a bigger picture for a better future for a brighter tomorrow. Let's stand united. Let's remove the veils and let's create a new world together. Are you that missing link? Join Jesse Hale on the Missing Link Talk Show as he helps to unveil the mystery through the unique wisdom and store of others. Three, two, one. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome everybody here back to The Missing Link. Today we're excited to have a quantum physicist, um, crystallographer. Um, he's an amazing man, talks about the electrical universe, the network of light, and he's here to come back for a second time here on The Missing Link. Welcome back, Dan Winter. How are you doing today, brother? I'm, I'm doing great. I, I always like your enthusiasm. You remind me of youth and inspire me. <laughs> it's good. Uh, Awesome. So why don't you start off with telling us about your journey, a little bit about your background, your education, what part of the world you grew up in, what part of the world you're in now, if you like disclosing that information, um, what got you into knowing about the secrets of the universe, um, anything about your story and your journey that you wanted to share with the audience here today, especially if they may be hearing you here for the first time. Yes. Uh, well, as you know, uh, the major project is at goldenmean.info and fractalfield.com. I've been teaching the physics of consciousness for over 30 years. It makes me sound young, but <laughs> actually, so I was doing um, graduate psychophysiology at University of Detroit after I did undergraduate work in electrical engineering. And then I was a systems analyst at IBM, trained in Detroit, Chicago, and Poughkeepsie. And then I became a a biofeedback inventor. I did electrical engineering in Buffalo, New York, ran an electric motor business, electric motor and generator for over 20 years. <laughs> and uh, then I started running around the world teaching physics of consciousness. I helped found Gaia TV. I founded a community in North Carolina. I lectured around Australia actually for 15 years in a row. Pretty much we went around the world teaching science and consciousness. A lot of people know me. My biofeedback inventions, the brainwave is flameandmind.com. The plasma tech is therify.net. And today we're going to talk more about uh, the physics of how the pyramid makes wireless power and what the implications of that are for the physics of how people get a soul because I think they're losing them. Oops. <laughs> well, why do you think that people are losing their souls? And do you think that when, you know, they talk about that someone sold their soul do you think that that's a real thing that someone could sell their soul well yeah i think it's i think it's actually critical that electrical engineers be teaching the physics of what it is to have a soul uh because i i think seriously the the hygiene on this planet particularly the electrosmog and the diet is costing uh, children their soul uh, large scale uh, by the millions actually and i think that's critical that this be taught and i'm passionate about that and i wanted to use the physics of pyramids to introduce but basically short summary so so after uh well first you know how it is often said that if you can lose a dream it means you will take memory through death many have, have seen that and and that is a an introduction to the physics we want to teach uh that um, lucid dreaming, and a lot of people maybe don't even know what a lucid dream is. Lucid dream is when you, in your dream, you can do something, go somewhere and bring back something that's testable, that was real. You met someone, you did something, something was physically real in the dream. And uh, the physics of lucid dreaming is very instructive to the physics of soul. Uh, first, we're teaching in the physics of consciousness movement uh, based on our brainwave tech, flameandmind.com, that consciousness is literally a uh, superfluid plasma vortex, a, a vortex made of charge inside your head. Literally, you're inhabiting an array, the, the net of fireflies, which is the synaptic array. So you have a hologram made of sparks called synapses. And in that array, this vortex inhabits that array. And then when you lose a dream and when you die, you need to inhabit a larger array or your toast. <laughs> it, it ain't complicated. 
<laughs> and th the skill to inhabit that a larger array is the subject of today's talk. So now let's review the science literature, and I'll bring up some slides in a minute, but let's just review briefly. So university studies shows there's a series of frequencies, low frequency infrasound kind of 47, 30 hertz, a cascade of frequencies that in university studies consistently helps fire lucid dreams. Now, we have a plasma tech called Therify.net, which creates a, a plasma cloud based on Antoine Priory, and we're doing rejuvenation with that Therify plasma in 25 countries. It's very powerful. And it turns out that we also consistently help trigger lucid dreaming. So then that brings up the question, how is the physics of lucid dreaming instructive about how people get a soul and maybe maybe we do need some pictures here. Otherwise, let me see if we can see if we can do this more critically. So I'm clicking on share screen window moment. Let me see if I can get the right one. And I have here's the pyramid wireless power site. Okay, now are you seeing are you seeing luciddreamteam.com there? On the um share screen? Yeah. The science and practice of lucid dreaming with groups is the video um lucid dream team at the top.com. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, what we want to talk about today is here in a university study, scientists trigger lucid dreaming with the frequency series. Among that series is 29 and 47 hertz, a low frequency cascade. Now, it turns out that what's behind that low frequency cascade that triggers lucid dreaming mm -hmm. Sorry, I lost my website here. All good, man. Let's see if I can scroll down. It doesn't let me scroll down. All right, well, let's try the Pyramid Wireless Power site. So are you seeing pyramidwirelesspower.com? Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah, it's letting me scroll down here. That's better. All right. So there is a, a frequency series here. Um, these You see the wave shape that looks like a caduceus here. In blue, uh, those are the harmonics from the equation planckfire.com, Planck times integer exponents golden ratio called charge collapse. And those low frequencies are literally the Schumann harmonics down here in green. I'm sorry that's so small, but 7.83, 14 point, and uh, just under 30 hertz. So the Schumann cascade here is predicted by the same equation, Planck fire, pure charge collapse, pure implosion. That predicts the harmonics of brain waves that trigger human bliss process. And that, that wave is called a phase conjugate pump wave. So in... Um, when, when you get that harmonic cascade in your brain waves and in your sacrocranial, I thought I had the, yeah, here's the sacrocranial. Good. Okay. Better slide here. So, and the caduceus is that wave that goes up and down. Is that what's called a caduceus? Yes, exactly. That, and that's okay. in physics, that's called phase conjugation. Although Hermes, those Ningashita called it the, the caduceus. It's literally implosion. And uh, that frequency series is the same whether I'm looking here at the documented low frequencies in the sacrocranial spine liquid pump that cause bliss and kundalini, uh, it's called the uh, tidal frequencies of the sacrocranial, well documented by Upledger. And so these are the low frequencies in the spine liquid which drive bliss and kundalini and all the fun stuff. If your spine liquid is pumping, it's clinically impossible to be depressed, according to Upledger. And the low frequencies of the breath and heart rate variability are the mechanism of that pump. Now, that same wave shape here is what we just discussed. The low frequencies of the Schumann harmonic cascade and the pure equation Planck times golden ratio and the low frequencies of the brain wave here from alpha, beta, all the way up to gamma. And here we have four harmonics in golden ratio. Now, the thing that unites all of these cascades is the frequencies involved are always simply Planck times the integer powers of golden ratio called phase conjugation or Planck fire, P-L-A-N-C-K-P-H-I-R-E, planckfire.com, my newest book, which is perfected charge collapse. Most physicists agree that charge collapse is the cause of consciousness and the cause of gravity. But most physicists don't know what the cause of charge collapse is and therefore don't know the cause of life, gravity, or consciousness. So once you know what charge collapse is, you have the answer. And in this case, we want to use that to look at uh, the physics of bliss and lucid dreaming. So let me just, I'm going to turn off this sharing now. I know I, I talk a little too fast. 
No, it's great. I just wanted to share a quick story with you. So just over a year ago, I had a double hip replacement surgery. And uh, when they stuck the needle into my back, um, when I, apparently when she was pulling out, she touched something and I could feel electricity in the bottom of my foot from a needle that was going in my back. And it just kind of solidified how electric beings that we are, that yeah. she touched little needle into my spine and I could literally feel like electricity was on the bottom of my foot so I just thought I would share that when you were talking about that spinal fluid and you know nice. kind of the electricity yeah. going through it and you know that brings up the physics of sacrocranial therapy in general that the sacrocranial practitioner touches the soft fascia tissue and feels the low frequencies of your spine liquid pump the, the 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 tidal frequencies that what we just showed the point one hertz mayer wave is the prime example the famous 10 second breath and when the sacrocranial practitioner is touching you and feeling the low frequencies of your spine liquid the attention inserted by the therapist measurably causes your spine liquid harmonics to organize so actually it is the centripetal power of human attention that brings into phase called negentropy, organizing the harmonics of the spine liquid pump. I did seminars on this for many years in South Spain with Mary Soul, and they would have six practitioners and they were holding, they're touching the points of a, let's say a, a child who had profound trauma and disabilities and messes. And after a, a like an hour or two of that kind of attention, their spine liquid harmonics would be incredibly organized and there were miraculous transformations in these kids. So this is an example of sacrocranial therapy and it's done all over the world. It's very powerful. The physics is instructive in that it was the centripetal power of inserted human attention that organizes and negentropically brings into phase, harmonizes the low frequency of harmonics in the spine, in the brainwave. And this is all measurable. We measured it in, we did voice analysis and we measured missing harmonics in the voice. And then we did brainwave analysis. My job was the biofeedback. Point is, now we need to understand what it is about human attention that makes it centripetal. This is, this is going to lead us to the physics of what is a soul. So we started out with this issue. We think that humans in terrible electrosmog environments, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and crap and crappy food and crappy diet and doctors that don't know what a soul is, <laughs> so they can't help you. Uh, so the, the physics is that the what creates a soul is specifically, as an electrical engineer, which needs to result from our understanding of this conversation. So when humans have access to that kind of low frequency coherence, we just talked about, it's called a phase conjugate pump wave. These are harmonic tensors, the low frequencies of the Schumann and the same Schumann harmonic cascade is exactly the low frequencies of the alpha, beta, gamma harmonics in the brain waves, which measurably call bliss, cause bliss when the brain waves literally implode. And that's called flameinmind.com, our brain wave system for measuring when we get golden ratio in the cascade from alpha to gamma, you measurably trigger bliss. And when you teach kids those low frequency harmonics in their brain waves, they begin to be able to see without their eyes. You can see all the pictures at flameinmind.com. It's very famous and it just happens. And this is part of the point we want to make today. It just happens that when you teach kids to trigger that alpha to gamma coherence in their brain waves. And now they're blindfolded and they're seeing without their eyes. It's very, it's done all over the world. This is very famous. We didn't invent this. But we discovered the physics. It just, just happens that when you teach kids these low frequencies in the brain, they go into the, the, this bliss trance and suddenly they begin seeing their ancestors. Oh my God. And the parents start freaking out, particularly Western parents. Actually, the Eastern parents, they can handle it. But when the kids start seeing their ancestors, it's like, oh, <laughs> they like lose it. But this is very instructive to the physics. So the physics is that when you get that harmonic cascade in the brain waves, again, visualize that liquid crystal vortex of charge like a Schauberger or water vortex inside your head, that vortex begins to implode. 
non-destructive charge collapse, tuned by golden ratio harmonics to squeeze the transverse EMF, the up and down component wave, down the throat of that vortex and spit out the nose cone of that vortex called Planck, PlankFire.com. That, that Planck length, the vortex converts the transverse EMF and spits out coherent longitudinal EMF, sometimes called scalar, incorrectly, or torsional. And that coherent longitudinal EMF, a compressional wave, bounces around an array that looks like this. For example, the earth grid dodecaecosis, sacred space. So the longitudinal waves, they will pass through about anything, but when they reach an, a symmetrical compression node called fractal, <laughs> the nodes of that array are literally the songline dreaming track. The nodes of that array are literally the only place Cozy Rev measured military quality telepathy. And they measured the magnetic flux density at those earth grid and the magnetic line crosses before they put the Cozy Rev mirror in, because that's the only place you got telepathy. Hint, hint, what is the physics? What the ancestors called dreaming track song lines, what others call collective unconscious communion of saints, ancestor memory. We got a bunch of names for it, but do we have electrical engineers? <laughs> so it turns out that the ability to inhabit that larger array depends on the compression that gets that inertia distributed in an organized way into that array. For example, the physics of dying successfully. So you know, for example, it's well known. We have lots of websites. I have too many websites. <laughs> I'll tell you, goldenmean.info slash immortality. You'll see the pictures. It's well known that when you die, you see a sequence of geometries called Heinrich Cuvé form constant, lattice cobweb tunnel spiral. And we don't have time to bring up all these images. But the reason you see those images, the map to successful death, is because you're doing the implosive compression. Like it's well known before you die, you got to see your whole life pass before you compressed. And that compression enables one specific thing, distribution into the array literally the physics of how you re release a stuck ghost, for example. And our Therify.net plasma longitudinal compression implosion is famous for releasing stuck ghosts. So the physics is that if you don't compress well at best, implode, <laughs> you don't get distributed into that array called ancestor memory. So what I'm telling you is we're beginning hinting at understanding the physics of what a soul is once we understand the kind of coherence that enables inhabiting that larger array. And that kind of coherence is very specific. For example, we can measure, and this is realheartcoherence.com. I discovered the physics of heart coherence and I taught HeartMath Institute how to measure their first EKG. And our real heart coherence technology will measure this. The low frequencies of the EKG measurably cause the DNA to braid the braid on the braid recursively implode. And again, we have pictures of this, but it's all at goldenmean.info slash DNA manifesto. And I want to make the point that when the DNA feels this low frequency phonon, it's like a ponytail caduceus. It's the same low frequencies from the brain wave and the sacrocranial and the low frequency of the breath called heart rate variability. It's all the same cascade, Planck times golden ratio. And when the DNA feels that, that phonon wave causes the DNA braid. So the th visualize the DNA is a thread of ratcheted dodecahedron down a helix. Now that thread will then braid and then braid the braid and then braid the braid of the braid on the braid. And the plot thickens. I mean, the DNA thickens. I mean, <laughs> it eventually becomes toroidal. And that very thick compressed DNA does one very specific thing. And then there are, we got photomicrographs of the very thick DNA thread in a torus. It's real. It's Lord of the Ring time. Anywho, what the DNA spits out is specifically as a result of that squeezing compression, the same thing the glands spit out and the same thing your brainwaves spit out, which is coherent longitudinal EMF, the stuff which inhabits the grid. The stuff, coherent longitudinal EMF, which Tom Bearden, my friend, proved by equation is the physics of what gravity waves are made of. I repeat, longitudinal EMF is the physics of what gravity waves are made of. Like the Sufis following the center of gravity to follow your attention, to follow the soul. 
So the point is that when you can spit out that longitudinal coherence, your body is able to inhabit an array. That is, your let me just give some examples from history. The Egyptians called this the Ba from the Ka. The Ba is the phase conjugate coherence, the literally longitudinal emission that results from the Ka, which is the coherence. The Tibetans call it the rainbow light body. Gurdjieff called it the Kezjan body. What do electrical engineers call it? That's my question. And, and I say we have an answer that if children do not have access to the coherent emotion, the dietary hygiene, and most of all, the capacitive environment to enable compression called sacred space. So you've got all the kids sitting in these aluminum buildings full of electrosmog and wifi and crap. They ain't never gonna feel that Schumann cascade. They ain't never gonna have bliss and they're losing their soul as measured by the losing the ability to lucid dream. This is my point like when Luke Skywalker went deep underground in nature before he could raise the Jed. You know what the Jed is? The Jedi means plasma projective. Anyway, I get excited. You know, I'm passionate about this. What do you think? I think it's amazing and people are loving um, this. Uh, Diane Smith says, I love it when people are smart enough to make my head hurt when I listen to them. So uh, wonderful stuff. Um, when you were mentioning this cranial um, sacral th mm -hmm. th therapy, so uh, Von der Luce says, maybe I could use some craniosacral therapy. So my beautiful girlfriend, Angeline, what she does sometimes is give me a cranial massage. And when she does that, it puts me into this like unreal state. Like I'm in this bliss, Beautiful. pure bliss state. So Beautiful. would that be, and she does it a little bit with my face and with my head and she just massages here. And I've never experienced anything like that before in my life. So would that be the cranial sacral yeah. therapy? And intuitively, I'm sure she's feeling the low frequencies. So the sacral cranial therapist can actually feel, for example, the 0.1 hertz uh, Mayer wave, which is the LF component of HRV, the most important frequency of the blood, that Mayer wave 0.1 hertz. And when you feel that, and then intuitively you move with that frequency, and gradually that becomes a pump wave. So that low frequency cascade of the Schumann harmonics, for example, is why the pyramids are called the Hummer, that they take that implosive compression that the Schumann cascade is a perfect phase conjugate pump wave. That's by design, thanks to Hermes, actually. And the pyramid converts then the transverse EMF of the Schumann cascade down that squirt gun. Remember, we measured this in the Bosnian pyramid. Bosnian pyramid got 7.83 hertz, you got 30. And then you got 53 hertz, golden ratio times 7.83. And then you go up on the roof and you got 28 kilohertz, fits the cascade perfectly. And a million people a year come there and they get rejuvenation in that pyramid. It's commercially successful as a rejuvenation, rejuvenator. Guess why? <laughs> it's a phase conjugate pump wave imploding. So the short, and this is all at pyramidwirelesspower.com. I don't know if we'll bother with pictures right now. But the point is, pyramidwirelesspower.com. The point is that that, it's called transverse EMF component, goes down that vortex squirt gun tube. Again, same story. And it gets squirted out the center of that vortex tube if it's tuned to golden ratio times Planck called PlankFire.com, which is the perfection, per, perfection of charge collapse, cause of gravity, consciousness, life force, and all negentropy, that drain hole only. So, so when, when the phase conjugate pump wave cascade goes down and squirts out the center at Planck threshold, because the caduceus is now working like the cracking of a whip. <laughs> and that longitudinal EMF then pumps the earth grid. Remember, the earth grid actually literally looks like this. And the, the bubbles, the nodes, the soap bubbles, are at the dodeci coast, the three-dimensional fractal nodes of that array, increasing the phase coherence of the longitudinal array. And that's called a gravity diode. If you read the book Two Thirds by David Byers and David Percy, the graphics are all there at pyramidwirelesspower.com. So what happens is that when the planet was tipping over after the last major, you know, lesser dryad, and and the, actually it was the Federation shooting to hell out of the remaining uh, draconian rep reptilians because 
Enki, although he founded Atlantis, the fact was he, it was under the control, the planet was under the control of the Draco half-brother and the Yahweh. And so they had to shoot the hell. <laughs> and Enki had to skip town. And there was a big flood, and that was about 10,000 years ago. And so then the place is tipping over. They installed the moon to hold it together, which only arrived about that time. And they used the pyramids as gravity diodes to stabilize the Earth on its new axis of tilt. And actually, that's how you maintain atmosphere on planets, is you use gravity diodes if you happen to know why objects fall to the ground. Now, if you don't know why objects fall to the ground, we think this might rattle your cage. So <laughs> and we don't want to rattle cages too bad. So we suggest learning why objects fall to the ground first. And that's all at pyramidwirelesspower.com. Basically, Gravity exists because of that implosion, for example, down the throat of the Planck radii times golden ratio, which is hydrogen radii. So hydrogen is doing this all the time. It's imploding through Planck. And that's how gravity exists because golden ratio enables the adding and multiplying recursively constructively of the phase velocities. So only in that form of fractal compression Physicists were right. Fractality is the cause of gravity, but golden ratio is the cause of fractality. So that adding and multiplying of the phase velocities down the throat of that vortex turns only that form of fractal compression into acceleration of charge towards center named the gravity, which is only a name for acceleration of charge towards center. So after you learn that, and you learn why objects fall to the ground, then you can learn about global wireless power and pyramid wireless power. Because then you can learn how the pyramid is functioning as a gravity diode by pumping liquid charge inertia into the longitudinal array by pumping that transverse down and pumping out that longitudinal coherence. So it's interesting that the same physics that allows you to have a soul is the same physics as what enables pyramids to stabilize Earth on its axis and stabilize gravity and atmosphere. And that same physics actually is what is the physics of bliss process. And then we use that story at pyramidwirelesspower.com to teach how the Atlantean fire crystal, the toy stone worked actually, how all zero point or vacuum energy devices exist only because of exactly that same non-destructive charge collapse charge implosion, which sucks charge through center. And that inertia creates the negentropy of, of uh, zero point energy. That's all at fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. So again, I went too fast, but maybe we had a little fun. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, yeah, we, we, this is great. And we do have some questions and comments uh, from the audience here that maybe we could get through with a few of them. Um, Von der Luz says scalar electromagnetics can manipulate gravity. So does that mean if you can figure this stuff out, um, could you essentially lift these big stones? People wonder how some of this stuff, did they use Absolutely. some of this technologies to be Absolutely. able to create the things with chisels and, and uh, uh, a cart and a horse where, yeah. you know, we're having a hard time creating structures like that with the amount of technology we have today? <laughs> the right question. So scalar electromagnetic, remember scalar is the wrong word for coherent longitudinal EMF. And when longitudinal EMF projection is asymmetric, which is to say direction, that's how you make gravity. Let me give you, there's pictures at pyramidwirelesspower.com. But again, very simple. Imagine this, you've got the trapezoidal, the trapezoidal shape of the various, very famous EM drive. So the EM drive is just a, a trapezoid it's, it's like a vortex. And inside, you've got a cascade of microwaves. Now, if you happen to know why objects fall to the ground, <laughs> then you could tune that and perfect it. You take the microwave and retune that caduceus going down that trapezoid, that caduceus microwave frequency, and you retune those frequencies to plonkfire.com. <laughs> then out the nose of that squirt gun down the vortex, you get more directional coherent longitudinal emf called gravity waves hello it ain't even complicated five-year-olds could understand why objects fall to the ground even though nasa einstein and stephen hawkins don't have a clue actually once you know how that charge inertia goes down the throat of that vortex it's see the transverse wave is going up and down it's not that coherent but when it comes squeezed down a vortex called translation vorticity then out the nose cone of that vortex you get that directional coherent longitudinal compressional emf 
And when that's directional, pointed in one direction. Another example, when you took Schauberger's vortex, remember it's a very well-charged pure water vortex now, which is then piezoelectrically doped with uh, piezoelectric rock powder like quartz or calcite. And so now it's very piezo. Now that vortex, the angle of that vortex, again, pictures at pyramidwirelesspower.com. The angle of that vortex is optimized, pyramidwire.com. Uh, then out the throat of that vortex comes a longitudinal plasma projection. For example, just before that water vortex from Schauberger began to generate electricity from gravity and began to make gravity, that wa water vortex spontaneously got colder. That's called neg entropy. That's because the implosion was self-organizing. So those are examples of understanding scalar electromagnetics, actually longitudinal plasma projection. Here somewhere in time is asking, do the direct lines connecting each pyramid bend or stay straight on a globe? If so, where is this measure measured? Just curious. Yeah, well, uh, before they installed cozy rev mirrors to get military quality telepathy, they would measure the nano Tesla magnetic flux density of the magnetic line nodal cross points, the same place where Bruce Cathy documented at those nodal cross points, dramatic reductions in nuclear critical mass. Hello, implosion is the opposite of radiation. Hello, implosive capacitance can contain the nukes. Hello, that's what the Ark of the Covenant was. <laughs> so, so the physics is that this is a straight line between the centers of the longitudinal node. Basically, the longitudinal wave can go ju through just about anything. For example, when uh, Ingo Schwann famously lit that thermistor with his mind in a Faraday cage repeatedly, the brain waves he did that, it's called flameinmind.com. So he's lighting a flame with his mind at a distance repeatedly in a Faraday cage. The longitudinal component that's spitting out from that brainwave implosion can go through about anything, including a Faraday cage, but it will only exchange inertia at the next compression node straight down the line. And that that next compression node, see at the compression nodes, the vortex is continuously exchanging inertia between the transverse and the longitudinal. So it's literally kind of a, a radio antenna array. <laughs> and that, that's, it's literally, literally DNA radio. It is literally the only place commercial military quality telepathy has ever been measured, Karatkov and Kozirev. So yes, the longitudinal nodes are straight lines down the road. And the long you won't catch the longitudinal if you're standing in between. <laughs> it's like when you have a tsunami, the tsunami is going through the ocean at about 600 miles an hour, and the boat on surface does not know it just went underneath. <laughs> That's called a longitudinal wave. However, when that longitudinal wave tsunami arrives at the shore, there's a... a concave, there's a vortex, there's a, the shore is part of a cone. So now the compression wave hits the shore and is pushed up down the vortex and becomes transverse. And that's the wave that'll kill you. <laughs> so the transverse, transverse wave can store heat. The longitudinal wave can deliver at a distance. It, can, it actually can contain heat at a distance. In fact, coherent longitudinal interferometry is the only physics of any action at a distance anywhere. And it is the only physics stargates and portals. And we could get into that, but I'm getting carried away. Go ahead. Next question. <laughs> uh, Roger Jokey um, from my home province here of Alberta um, says question. And, and I think a little lead into the question was people say that this is Satan's world. Satan's in charge of this place and all this kind of stuff. I don't know how that works phys in physics, but he says, question, we are in the presence of knowledge being used for good God or evil. Whereabout are we presently in? I've been doing lectures for, I don't know, five years or so with uh, Elena Danan, who I think is very good at teaching about the history of these things. Um, and I think she's right. Uh, well, I also work with uh, Anton Parks for years, who documented the history of Enlil Yahweh, who um, uh, was half Draco, actually, 
and um, brought a lot of evil, I think, to this planet. But it, electrically, it is very simple what evil is. Evil is live spelled backwards. L, L into the I of I to live, and evil is live spelled backwards. So L into the I of I is to turn into the focus of recursion. So it's simple. Evil, which is the inverse of that, is failure to embed. <laughs> In other words, essentially destructive wave interference. So evil never is actually personified. That's childish. Actually, is, is, is destructive wave interference. Another way of saying that is when you go to bed at night, if you can play your day like it was a movie and not interrupt, it means you've digested into pure principle the experience of your day and you're ready to die. I mean, ready to compress well. I mean, ready to sleep. I mean, ready for bliss. So the point is that what was evil was the part of the memory of your day, which was not a shareable wave. <laughs> Perfectly shareable waves enable perfect distribution. And the only thing that can enter the perfect distribution in that array, which is literally, you know, a billion years of DNA library storing only pure principle survival information, Eureka. <laughs> so until you can digest your day into a shareable wave, you ain't ready to sleep, you ain't ready for bliss, and you ain't ready for death. <laughs> so that's the difference between good and evil, quite literally. Now, the history of that is, is the history of Enlil Yahweh, the Draco, on this planet and how it kind of made a mess of things, but it gave us a great challenge. Anyway. And we've had Elena Dannon on here a bunch of times, so we right. always appreciate we always appreciate her uh, you know, teachings and her um, information. Albert Sanchez Jr. from our YouTube channel is asking, how do longitudinal waves compare or work with ley lines of the Earth? Yes. So... Um, we have a major project on advanced geobiology, goldenmean.info slash geobiology, and we've done the spectrum analysis thanks to our partner, uh, Stefan Cardino, you'll see there, and documented the infrared and the low frequency components of Hartman-Curry pay ray lines, et cetera. But the, the summary of what we're saying here is what's called ley lines is in effect a name for the bloodstream of that longitudinal array, that the ley lines are identical with what the aboriginals called dreaming track song lines. And remember when Auntie Lorraine died, the storm that went across the Australian continent 3,000 miles at the time of her death, that ley line was the family pet of her family for thousands of years. It, you know, if you think of it as a long snake, but it's actually the family pet of that family that could talk to and play with that intelligent plasma in that array. So it's how this all starts is learning how plasma becomes self-aware. For example, study why it is that the toroidal shape of ball lightning is so famous for responding to telepathy. I suggest that it's essential to understand that physics. Then you can understand how plasma becomes self-aware, essentially turning inside out recursively. Albert says, wow, thank you, Dan. And uh, Travis from our YouTube says, what do the fish do underneath during tsunamis? Yeah, it's interesting. So this compression wave that's traveling at 600 miles an hour under the ocean does not disturb much. Just like the longitudinal wave doesn't mess with the Faraday cage when it hits it, actually. Because <laughs> this is a compression wave traveling like this. So Anything that can distribute that array uh, is not hurt. I want to give a much more specific example now. Supposing, uh, supposing you were studying the physics of tornado steering. We do this at goldenmean.info slash dousing. So if you're watching a shaman steer a tornado, the first thing you see is the tornado is feeling the pain of the tornado the tornado experiences pain whenever it passes over something that cannot distribute charge efficiently. This is the beginning of our metaphor here. So if, if you cannot distribute charge efficiently, that tornado feels that as pain. For example, a metal building. Tornadoes love to destroy metal buildings because that's a bad dielectric and capacitance doesn't travel through easily. The same reason a metal roof helps prevent lucid dreaming. It's the worst. It's the wrong dielectric. Biologic materials have a great dielectric, means capacitive charge distribution efficiencies. Where when buildings are made of metal, they are pain to that tornado. So tornadoes are famous for they will go to the trailer park and wipe that out first. 
because it felt like pain. Whereas if you get an ancient stone circle and a sacred stone church, a tornado will never, 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 ever touch that. Will not destroy it. No, because that felt like part of the body of that tornado because charge distribution was enabled. So being part of that body is the trick. So longitudinal waves have no problem with things which have good dielectrics, but things which have bad dielectrics, metal buildings and ugly cities with horrible electrosmog, longitudinals do not get through, which means your children do not feel the Schumann cascade, which means your children do not feel. Now we have uh, uh... Don asked if you were a student of the I Ching. <laughs> well, I Ching is very useful because it's displaying the 64 permutations of three, which are the codons, so not just the I Ching, but how DNA is assembled. So effectively, everything in the universe is the permutations of three, especially the assembly of DNA. And that's a very predictive and useful geometric metaphor. And extended triangles, you can see that in actually the DNA codons as they nest and braid. So it's very useful. And they say the spirits of the I Ching are even more advanced than the Tarot. And you can literally speak to those spirits. They're called egregore. Uh, we had another question here. Um, much love, Brother Dan. Would you say plasma is another phase of water, hence why we see angels in the clouds, thus water is creator consciousness? That's a very useful question. So actually, remember, the universe is 99.999% plasma. Physicists are clear. What is plasma? <laughs> plasma is a name for the universal uh, superfluid called charge, otherwise known as the ether. And the compressibility of that superfluid is the reason the universe exists. And when that charge or plasma rotates, that rotation of charge is the only origin and definition of stores inertia called mass. Only way mass is originated and defined is that rotation of charge, plasma. Now, that rotation of charge has a period of rotation and the period of that rotation is the only origin and definition of time. In other words, time is only a name for spin rate, nothing else. This crap about bending spacetime is useless. Actually, it's simply because acceleration happens in the direction where you implode. Anywho, so back to water. So at the center of the ladder rung bond of the water, called clathrate cage, is hydrogen. I wrote the equation to prove that you take Planck, multiply by golden ratio, and you get exactly, exactly, exactly three hydrogen radii. In other words, I was the first to prove how and why hydrogen is fractal. Hint, the center of every water bond. Hint, the center of every DNA ladder rung codon. Hydrogen, implosive, supports lightning. So yes, can we distribute plasma there? Absolutely. Prime example is if you watch a child standing in a mud puddle, hopefully well-grounded, looks at a cloud gleefully, happily, and focuses their attention and puts a hole in that cloud. So the implosion, the centripetal force of their charge does the physics of what's called Christos, I mean crystallization, which is implosion. And that's what teaches the water vapor to become a droplet. It's very precipitating. It's fascinating because a lot of times I'll go outside to walk the dog and it's totally cloudy and you don't see the sun or anything. And then just within a few minutes or, you know, it just opens up and the sun starts peeking through. And this happens like quite often more than not that the sun ends up coming out. And I don't know if it's us having an effect on that, if it just naturally would have came out. But for some reason, I feel that somehow the sun is out there and wants to shine on us. So things just open up for us. And I'm not sure what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, well, no, notice the relationship between when you feel joyful and when you radiate charge, which is implosive. Remember, the child that's able to put a hole in the cloud generally is a child that's grounded. And the physics of grounding here is access to the charge distribution that enables embedding, literally access to fractality, same meaning for electricians as psychologists, grounding. So the book Earthing is profoundly instructive. And when you go outside, you take your joy and you get earthed and there, there's the implosion. <laughs> uh, V11 says, can you tell us a bit about your imploder and new super imploder? Yeah, so at theimploder.com or now imploder.net, you can see the product line. Basically, 
I took that equation for the structure of hydrogen, five and 10 golden spirals down that perfect 60 degree implosion cone. I should have brought one of the gadgets up here. And so that implosion cone now, if that water is a bit piezo, works better with hard water, then that vortex will deliver spin density and charge density at the throat of that vortex. Now, what we also do is we take this super centripetal magnetics. And so you got this spun water molecule highly charged out the throat of that vortex, and you put it between that implosive magnetic array, and it shreds, spins, and creates much greater spin density, which even works in the vortex by itself, the imploder shower. People swear it eliminates the chlorine and they feel charge with the imploder shower or more powerfully when we put the magnetic array down the throat there super imploder ultra imploder we create dramatically reduced molecular cluster size dramatically increased spin density and therefore dramatically increased solubility remember hydration is the issue of probably the majority of diseases in not just plant growth, but for humans as well. So it tastes better, it's spin dense, it's charge dense. And this has been out there for, I don't know, about 12 years. And these things, you know, people love them. <laughs> they, they go to that imploder shower. So you can see that. So what we did is we took, we call it Schauberger's dream. We took the principle of implosion and applied it practically. I did the 3D CAD cam to make the perfect vortex. Um, question from Albert says, does the plasma charged rotation always turning clockwise? Isn't the earth slightly turning counterclockwise at the moment? Well, if you ask any biologist generally why every living protein on this planet has a directional enantiomorphic helicity asymmetric, the helix goes one way only for every living protein. Hello, why don't you ask your local biologist why? I get the answers, they don't seem to have a clue. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I, I would like to suggest a clue. I would like to suggest a clue. You know, in the literature, it's quite clear that the polar direction of a magnet that you use to reduce the pain of your toothache, if you take the positive side of that magnet, and remember the Chinese and the West use different term for positive and negative, so it's confusing as hell, but you can see this at goldenmean.info slash magnetics. But if you take the positive side of the magnetics, which is centripetal, you will increase the pain and increase the healing rate. So the centripetal side of the magnet, whereas if you take the negative side of that same strong magnet and stick it on the toothache, you reduce the pain Remember, pain is failure to compress. When the fractal gets broken, the compression is broken and charge bleeds, and that's named pain. So you restore store compression, and it is the opposite of pain in general. And that is the generalized principle of piezofire.com, my newest invention, and therify.net. They all use the idea of restored implosive compression dramatically reduces pain. You stick our piezo fire, P H I R E piezofire.com on hernias. It's amazing. So the centripetal side increases the pain, but, and the heating rate, because it makes it more centripetal. So when you restore centripetal forces, it restores the healing rate because it makes it negentropic, self-organizing. So back to DNA and why they don't know which side the magnet. Now here's the DNA wandering around in the primal soup. And here come the lightning, man. Here come the lightning here. I think I think life is about to be born. It's called primal soup. Here come the lightning. Here come the lightning. The lightning comes down and adds spin. And then when you spin that protein, it makes the first DNA. Now, why is every living protein on that planet got a helix that goes one way only, which biologists don't seem to have a clue? Let me suggest a clue. The polar DC direction of the lightning which was centripetal, could spin those proteins centripetally into that helix and create the beginning of braiding. But the centrifugal polarity of that DC lightning would blow the hell out of those proteins, flying them apart. And you ain't never going to get life that way. So I suggest that's a clue. Hello. Anne from our Facebook is asking, do plants grow anti-clockwise above the equator? Remember, the 
the Coriolis force, which is different between the North and South hemisphere, is a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the actual magnetic inertia of the Earth's rotation. So to pick up the Cor Coriolis force, you need something very, very, very sensitive. For example, though, if you do have water in a, in, a, in a sink, and that sink is pretty circular, and you pull the plug, it's true. It will go out in the opposite direction, the north versus southern hemisphere. That's real. That's called Coriolis forces. But the difference between the, the power and the Coriolis force between the, but versus the natural magnetic wind of the spinning Earth is like one one millionth of a percent. So it's a very weak relative force. So no, plants don't grow the other way there. No. <laughs> but there is, there is a difference. It's very slight. And it does indicate the relationship to the Earth's rotation. There is some evidence that's been circulating around lately about us getting energy from the ether. They used to put metal rods on the top of buildings with a giant ball. And inside that ball was filled with mercury. And the mercury would spin around in the ball, creating energy forming down through and powering the building. And I was wondering if what's your thoughts on that is. Well, I think it would be instructive to learn the physics of why mercury was used inside pyramids to increase the amount of power they gener generated, which we know well if you studied the ancients. So most of the ancient pyramids had mercury in them for a similar reason. So uh, let me give several examples. Uh, in the vortex that was called the Mana Nazi Bel Hanabu, uh, you could make some gravity if you used water, piezoelectric water, in that vortex like Schauberger did with the repulsing. However, if you use mercury, which had much higher specific gravity, and then you added a trace iron powder to make it magnetic flux permeable, and that required a wetting agent, which is a secret. And then they also used a trait low level radioactivity, which made it quasi superconductive. Now that vortex can make a huge amount of gravity. And that's how the Hanabu Nazi Bell Vimana flew, actually, because that implosive vortex then spit out longitudinal at the tip of the nose cone. Now the mercury inertia, storing the inertia of implosion, if you got this pyramid, remember the pyramid wireless power principle, there's the pyramid, it's profoundly piezoelectric, and it's tuned to golden ratio times Planck exquisitely, precisely. If you don't got 7.8 hertz, 50, the cascade is not right, that pyramid ain't making no global wireless power. No, once it's tuned correctly, now it's piezoelectrically vibrating. The ancients called it the Hummer. And it's humming specifically the low frequencies of Shunan, which, by the way, is the physics of human bliss in the brainwaves. And people have bliss in pyramids, as did I. I got in the king's chamber and the lights went out, had a little fun. <laughs> Anywho, uh, the mercury takes that piezoelectric infrasound oscillation and concentrates it. So any liquid, when it's spinning in the right vortex, can make some implosion but mercury can make more. Now, I'm not saying using mercury to make gravity is elegant. Hell no, it's inefficient, it's obsolete, it's antique and it's poisonous, this is crap. But you learn the principle here, then later you do it with crystals and finally, which is called the fire crystal poison, finally you do it with your DNA and you float. But the mercury in that vortex, it, when it's oscillating, remember the building should be vibrating at the Schumann and if that building is in nature, you got a shot. If that building is in the middle of a horrible electrosmog city, then hell no, you ain't going to get much power there. But it's the idea of imploding densely, the piezoelectric natural oscillations of the earth called the Schumann phase conjugate pump wave. Those buildings that still have the balls on top filled with mercury, apparently they have to have a wire on each side of them that go big cable that goes straight down into the ground, which grounds it to stop it from spinning. You know, they don't want people to know that there is alternative energy like this mercury balls because of their control system of, you know, needing all of the energy to be monitored, you know, paid for and taxed opposed to us having some of these free energy technologies. Well, remember, relationship to ground is critical for everything. And even the pyramids, they had a head of a very solid relationship to ground to enter into the distribution array so that the other pyramids tuned precisely could be pickup points for 
globalwirelesspower.com, pyramidwirelesspower.com, sorry. So the reason Tesla failed, first, he had the harmonics wrong. He used 60 cycle, uh, 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 can't even make carbon nano. No, you need 50 in the cascade, go to the five. Also, Tesla didn't know where the nodes of the longitudinal array were. He was out on the line, lawn trying to pick up power in the light bulbs on the lawn, plugging them into ground, but he didn't plug them into the nodes of the longitudinal array, effectively dousing required. <laughs> so your relationship to that ground, again, I recommend the book Earthing, gives you that ability to distribute the charge accurately. And that is the key. Remember, all vacuum energy, sometimes called zero point energy or free energy, is that charge collapse only. Fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. Here we have uh, a question. Oh, where did we get that? Uh, what is Dan's thoughts on electroculture gardening? <laughs> yes. Uh, our friend Philippe Forer is famous here in France. And he, he, you know, the size of the copper wire determined how long the carrots went underground. <laughs> no, electroculture is real and powerful and beautiful. And effectively, what you're doing is you're recognizing the physics. There's very instructive physics about plants. You know, uh, every Steiner biodynamic gardener knows you have to avoid the moon for a seed to germinate. Uh, and that physics is very ins uh, instructive that, you know, if you put the, I tell the story, man, they put a copper plate on the roof and a wire down to a copper plate in the basement. And the basement is pitch black. Plants grow just fine because they get that longitudinal wave from the sun. However, <laughs> at the moment when the moon came between the earth and the sun a few days ago, <laughs> that because the moon is hollow in metal, it's a horrible dielectric <laughs> and it completely blocks the longitudinal wave of the sun. So now, if, you, if you're measuring the magnetic flux density of the Earth grid, and this is measured, you can see it at goldenmean.info slash geobiology, the Earth grid magnetic lines go, they completely deflate and collapse when the moon blocks the sun, which then inhibits plant growth, inhibits DNA radio, inhibits all charge distribution. Actually, when the moon blocks the sun, it's pretty messy time because the array collapsed. It's a good time to put a new stone in your labyrinth because you can retune the plumbing when the pressure goes off. But <laughs> eclipses are messy. So electroculture is an example of harnessing the centripetal force. Remember, the primary purpose of ancient stone circles and pyramids, one of the primary things they were used for, was zapping the seeds. You zap a seed in a pyramid stone circle or therify.net. You get dramatic. They're talking 300% growth benefits, especially in marijuana. <laughs> the imploder.com. They love our therify.net. They buy them. And we got an agricultural university in Germany here bought the therify just to zap their seeds. Well, the reason that causes seeds to grow is you added the symmetric centripetal force. And that implosive squeezing is the definition of the moment of germ germination because it really sucks. I mean, because it has to suck. Otherwise, it ain't going to suck in the first nutrient. And that suction is the result of implosion. So you need symmetrical compressionals. The same physics is why the first nuclear device was called implosion, because you need the phonon longitudinal symmetrically arriving. And that's the definition of critical mass. It's a very interesting thing. Next uh, question comes from Don in our YouTube says, so you consider the e egregore of I Ching to be separate from the spirit of other forms of forms of divination. I'm not so sure I consider the force to be the same, just different syntax. Well, I think the essence of what we're saying today is there ain't nothing that's really separate from anything. <laughs> that's, the, that's the fundamental message we got today. If it's a unified field, hello. However, it's true that the ancient lineage of the I Ching tradition says is even more ancient than the, than the, 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 you know, the, the, the cards. But really, that's a very subjective argument. But the concept of egregore is real. 
clearly. And there is a voice, for example, you know, if a billion people say the Our Father, <laughs> that's an egregore. That has inertia. It has mindfulness. It has presence because of the inertia of that collective unconscious. The collective unconscious itself is mindful. And when we direct that in ways that relate to the collective attention, and that's where we go at luciddreamteam.com in our motion most recent viral video from the fractalu.com, Fractal University Online, which has gone viral, fractalu.com, last Sunday, every Sunday, was on lucid dreaming. And what uh, Jenny taught there is very instructive. So three ancient Aboriginal grandmothers, she called them the aunties, took her under their wing and said, we need to, to teach you how to steer a collective lucid dream. Ooh. You know, you see, you see these Aboriginal shaman, and they're sitting there, and their eyes closed. You think they're sleeping, but actually, what they're doing is bending a storm a thousand miles down the song line. They're steering the damn tornado. <laughs> well, how are they doing it? How were they aware of the centripetal force in the collective lucid dream? Remember, Christ consciousness just as a name for whoever's most centripetal in the local array, right? Christos. So. The ability to steer a group in a lucid dream is a teachable skill to steer that tornado, which is literally steering the center of focus with your attention. It's actually the amount. Remember, Bill Tiller, conscious acts of creation, measured 20 different ways, focused human attention is electrically centripetal. That is proven, cannot be argued. I am the first one to explain how and why focused human attention is electrically centripetal. It's implosive. It's literally, for electrical engineers, a measurement of how consciousness, how conscious you are, how centripetal you are, means how big the tornado you can steer. <laughs> We've connected with lots of people that, you know, are don't subscribe to the earth being a spinning ball spinning around the sun. They feel that things are spinning above us. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, Gene Spliced says from our YouTube, now prove the earth is rotating. And one more quarter says right afterwards, science has never proven spin ever. Um, what would you say just to quickly summarize? Yeah, I think uh, the flat earth theory is a psyop to profoundly disempower and confuse people. I promise I would never waste my time on that crap. However, if you ask a physicist the origin of spin, <laughs> they will get profoundly confused because <laughs> the origin of spin is the only origin of mass and time. You rotate, remember, rotate charge, that inertia is named mass. Rotate charge, that period is called time. If you don't rotate, no spin, there ain't no mass and no time ever. It ain't even defined without rotation. So yeah, spin has an origin and it's really simple. If you got the superfluid called the ether or charge and there's movement in the superfluid, Every other form of movement that is not symmetric is going to die. And waves do not like to die. So in order to get immortal, they discovered spin. And that's how they got the power of distribution. And then when that spin made the perfect vortex and created that common wavelength called Planck, the musical key signature of every wave physics has ever measured, that is the origin of spin, spinning around Planck. And in fact, you go, uh, you know, a billion light years in all directions, Planck is the same. Why? The Big Bang doesn't begin to explain it. No, actually, the reason Planck is the same for light years in every direction is because at the Planck threshold, the, the compression converts the transverse to longitudinal only there and then starts distribution in that, in that into that array called the gravity grid. Golden ratio is the dominant geometry of all orbital mechanics. This is a smoking gun. <laughs> so implosion creates charge distribution. And that all began with the origin of spin. Um, Kiwi from our YouTube says, I wonder what da is Dan's explanation on the fine constant minus 137? Fine structure constant is a beautiful study in sacred geometry. And we have a whole website about it, goldenmean.info slash prediction. In fact, you can, 
You can derive the fine structure constant from optimized translation of vorticity in a vortex. It's a beautiful and profound study, uh, goldenmean.info slash predictions. But we can't do that discussion here. But yes, fine structure constant is a beautiful and profound meditation. Now, um, what are some of the more important or recent discoveries that you think is, you know, that people should be aware of, you know, kind of in scientifically or maybe even just personally yourself? Well, I think the relationship between the possibility of zero point energy, vacuum energy, making gravity and the physics of soul and how those things fit together are literally the difference between our planet becoming soulless and not. That's why I'm so passionate about this business of the physics of soul, that once you understand the physics of bliss process, you got the gold ratio cascade in your brain waves, you're imploding, you become a zero point source of electrical energy. And that is the first day you are not a parasite because you are your own source of zero point vacuum energy. So access to bliss process. This is a very powerful physics. What is the cause of human bliss? It is implosive charge collapse and then charge radiance. Golden ratio cascades in the brainwave is just the beginning. Flameandmind.com. So the fact that the physics of bliss is identical, charge collapse, with the physics of all zero point energy technologies, hello, is that empowering? Everybody says, oh, well, some evil, whatever, you know, underground government is stealing zero point energy from us. Hell, well, you know, until you yourself take the interest to discover the physics of zero point energy for yourself, which happens to be the same as the physics of bliss, and ain't because anybody stole zero point energy from you. Hell no. It's because you didn't figure it out for yourself. You know? So I'm just saying, well, yes, we are susceptible to lots of parasites. Yes. When you have a source of bliss implosion inside, then you have access to the global collective unconscious. You can ask any question of your inner voice, the nodal array, ancestor memory, ancestor phone calls. Remember when... Uh, John D had the showstone, which was actually an Aztec obsidian mirror like the like the Olmec used. And it's a phase conjugate mirror, the same principle Nostradamus used on the bot bottom of his scrying water. And the phase conjugate mirror enables seeing the future and ancestor phone calls because the phase conjugate mirror puts you in touch with a longitudinal array. So now there's an invention like, oh, phase conjugate mirrors are the first place negentropy and time reversal was ever measured in physics, but also <laughs> it's the only way to make phone calls to ancestors, the same principle. This is what John D devoted his life to. He was using scintillating light, like in the pinhole camera. And he used that for ancestral communication, which he got from the Aztec who got it from Veracocal Quetzalcoatl, who was Thoth Hermes also called the line of David, you know? So the technologies all revolve around charge collapse perfected, plonkfire.com, which is what the caduceus is, phase conjugation. And once we understand charge collapse, we understand vacuum energy, human bliss, how you get a soul, how you travel in time, stargates, you know, lucid dreaming. It's all the same principle, implosive charge collapse in contact with the longitudinal array. Now that's a discovery. Are you talking about the John D that people say was like connecting demons to the Royals or I'm, I, I haven't studied it too much, but is that the John D that you're talking about? I'm talking about the John D who my best friend at the time, Vincent Bridges insisted, Vincent Bridges insisted I was a reincarnation of. That's the John D I'm talking about. <laughs> but no, see, John D, he was a character, man. I mean, astrologer, he invented the term British Empire. He invented longitude and latitude pretty much, you know. <laughs> and so what he was fascinated with was how, for, first, they they had a scrying stone called the show stone, which is a form of vase phase conjugate mirror. And they did, they saw plasma shadows in that called the Ophanum Enochian alphabet. You can see the graphics. It's a hypercube superpose, superset of the tetra cube of the Hebrew, actually. And you can see the holographics, goldenmean.info slash ophanim, O-P-H-A-N-I-M. So 
they they were doing scrying and they the angels were and remember angels are interstellar plasma intelligences and they are real in spite in spite of the fact that you know somebody called them macrobes and they said they were evil well they're not good or evil they're just intelligent interstellar plasma intelligences and they love to communicate and this is the physics of what angels are interstellar plasma intelligence and he was like into it man so anyway he like a year before he did it, he told Pr Queen Elizabeth he was going to create the storm that took out the Spanish Armada. And, and, and then this was later called the Tempest in Shakespeare. And in Shakespeare, Francis Garland is the name of, of uh, Shakespeare in John Dee's notebook, actually, who learned how from John Dee. So he was, uh, he was the Tempest. Uh, he was the wizard. So when you invoke interstellar, very large plasma intelligences like steering tornadoes he used the seven hills five hills of prague very fractal to invoke these plasma alphabet of symmetry the same symmetry alphabet of plasma shadows used to make the movie stargate of and Minokian right out of john d <laughs> and and so the and the meteorology of where the storm came from that took out the spanish armada ain't never happened before in history out of the north sea and that was an unusual storm <laughs> the tempest so john d was a character now john d believed in astrology in a way that i consider childish actually however he was very 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 close and we spent a lifetime studying the intentions of john d so when he was using scintillation between mirrors literally spark gaps to communicate with ancestors he was very very close to the physics of communicating with a longitudinal array we have I don't know, 20 movies about that. Goldenmean.info slash Ophanum, including the physics of alchemy. So John D. and Kelly, his partner, the scryer, they made the purest gold ever measured in the history of physics, measured by the Royal Society of UK, the leading scientific body on the planet, the purest gold ever measured in history. And how did he make that? It was a little bit, you take this, in this case, it was a, the same, the same red powder, projective powder, uh, philosopher's stone used by Flamel. And it's a red powder. And uh, what they did is they convinced uh, the, the mad caliph uh, who had just gone mad from eating the ground up Kaaba stone, which was a philosopher's stone. And the philosopher's alchemists often ate the projective powder. And see, that meteorite was a glass meteorite and projected through it was a vaporized gold nanobubbles, which made it super dielectric and implosive. A little bit of that powder, you could catalyze the charge collapse between isotopes, which is the physics of alchemy, actually. And then if you get the right phone on, et cetera, et cetera, you get into flavor. So the red powder projection was actually an introduction to the physics of super dielectrics. And this is an introduction introduction to isotope transition catalyzed charge collapse of physics of alchemy and john d was well it was really kelly I and mean, that's another long story and and king rudolph ended up killing kelly for that it's messy messy but the physics of alchemy non-destructive charge collapse is exactly exactly what human bliss is about ryan peak from our facebook has a great question how would dan define a miracle <laughs> A, 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 mir a miracle is something you think is wonderful, but you ain't figured out the science yet. <laughs> Cor like Course in Miracles, for example, saying there is no order of definition in, in miracles. This is crap. <laughs> this is disempowering, saying you ain't supposed to understand. <laughs> Course in Miracles was a low-grade astral, man. It was crap. You are supposed to understand. And that means what you used to call miracles is now physics. That soul that you were talking about, when a sperm fertilizes an egg, there's like a spark, like a God spark. And then apparently at the end, when we leave our bodies, there's some type of similar type of, you know, energy that kind of leaves. Um, you know, what do you think that God spark is, where it originates, and where does it go after we you know, kind of leave our physical meat suits. I think that's a useful metaphor, actually. You know that, that the um, critical mass of sperm heads in touch with the egg delivers a centripetal implosive capacitance, 
which is the physics of why there are seven stages of invagination as uh, Steiner documented and we animated. So the first move you ever made was that turning inside out specifically went from the zygote um, was specifically in response to the right spark, which had to be implosive capacitive, namely centripetal. So, so this, the, the, then actually they say that it was usually an array of sperm that could cause the egg to turn inside out. And by the way, you know, the Celtic Celts knew that it's better if the grand and great grandparents are present watching at that moment of first insemination, because their attention adds to that centripetal force. Talk about a spark, man. <laughs> and, and in the old, in the old days, they, they used to say, well, you know, if you measure the number of ounces, the body loses in weight at the moment of death. And often I think you do. The problem was they couldn't replicate very well because it's different for people. And the reason it's different is some people have less soul than other people. But actually, if you see at the moment of death, when uh, there's a sudden death and people die in a forest and you have the right kind of camera, you can see the soul leave. It's beautiful. We've got lots of pictures. It's very common. However, you take the same kind of picture in some kind of damn hospital, all that crappy metal and electrosmog. No, you do not see that coherent plasma bubble leave. Guess why? Because hospitals do not know what a soul is. They don't know what death is electrically, which is horrible, horrible. I mean, it's literally hell. <laughs> you need the altar at Machu Picchu if you want to do it right, really. So the place for optimum plasma projection is where the magnetic lines cross and where you can jump from the little array inside your head to the bigger array in the longitudinal array. So proper electrical preparation for death desperately needs to be taught. And that's the spark, man. Someone said that the future of medicine is frequency and vibration. And I'm just wondering what's your thought, because it seems like this allopathic drug poisoning oil based medicine is keeping us at a low vibrational frequency. Yeah, the doctors don't know what soul is, and that means they're making soulless kids and this ain't good. <laughs> uh, actually, obviously, everything is frequency. So... <laughs> To say that medicine, well, yes. But the more important thing is the frequencies that cause life and health and immune health, they are always, always, always implosive charge collapse. So you take plonkfire.com predicting brainwave harmonics, heart harmonics, sacrocranial harmonics, hydrogen harmonics, water harmonics, all implosion, all, and you plot that on the graph of everything alive and you get the frequency signature of all life which is the frequency signature of charge implosion definition of life named plonkfire.com. So it isn't that it's just about frequency. It's about the right frequency, which is implosive, enabling life, enabling charge communion. And that is the secret behind all negentropy, actually. And when we understand that, we're going to design buildings that are alive. We're going to design electric power grids that whose resonance themselves becomes self-aware. Someone asked earlier on, they said the last few days, the Schumann resonance has been off the charts. And, you know, lately, even these last few years, apparently it's been, you know, it's been wildly going up and down, but on a higher scale than normal. Um, why do you think the Schumann resonance is, you know, on a higher than normal you know, trajectory, especially these last few years or even these last few days? Someone said they were it was off the charts. Yeah, it was profoundly misleading to tell people the Schumann resonance is increasing. That is crap. What is increasing is the presence of harmonic inclusiveness in the cascade. So the 7.83 hertz is the circumference divided by speed of light. And that ain't changing, man. Sorry, 7.83 hertz is nailed right to the wall. It ain't changing. It ain't going up. Forget that. That's I'm sorry, Greg Braden, but that's a crappy illusion. No, but what defines immune health in general, start with your heart rate variability, defining all immune health is harmonic inclusiveness. So when the number of harmonics in the cascade increases, which is to say the phase conjugation becomes more broad spectral, which is to say it becomes more centripetal, which is to say it becomes more centri more self-aware. So you measure the number of harmonics superposed in rotation 
and only Golan ratio enables you to superpose. That's called how many dimensions are you living in? It's not just increase in density. It is increased in superposed axes of spin symmetry, the only definition of going to the next dimension. And by the way, when that cascade goes to a climax, you open stargates, man. <laughs> Uh, Gene from our YouTube says, has Dan ever experimented with Dysinian um, lenses in his soul observations? Is that the movie They Live? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious, man. Our friend Michael Helius said that they forced Kodak, Kodak to take that lens off the market because you could see who had a soul. Oh, shit. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. No, it's... The point is that in a certain lens, you can see res residue of longitudinal coherence. It's not just blue fire in the aura. It's actually residue of longitudinal. So obviously, that kind of lens is related to the way the Aztec and the Olmec used obsidian mirrors to make ancestor phone calls. If you've got a partial phase conjugate in the array, then you can prehend the longitudinal component in exactly the way that when your brain waves implode and you're your aura becomes very spin dense and you're still and centered. That is the physics of clairvoyance, prehending the components of the longitudinal array, literally ancestor radio. So yes, there are many ways, including this type of lens, to see whether the aura has longitudinal coherence. The sad thing is, you know, every electrical engineer on this planet knows how to pick up and receive transverse EMF, but how to pick up and receive longitudinal EMF? <laughs> 99.99% of electrical engineers have never even heard or thought about it, even though that's the physics of soul. You think we got a problem with our electrical engineers? Yes. <laughs> now, what's your thoughts on time travel? And I'm not just specifically asking about whether the mind could go travel back in time or the mind could maybe travel into the future and see future events, but actual like physically maybe going through a stargate or some kind of a contraption where all of a sudden you're bounced in your physical body, you know, like you're leaving your body and you're, you know, like off here on earth and you're physically transporting to the dragon days of Lancelot or whatever, or, you know, going into the future. Cause we hear these things like, Oh, someone came from 2040 and gave us all these predictions and like come in a physical form. I don't see that as physically possible but i'm just wondering what your thoughts on actually being able to go from place and dimension back and forth in time well let's start with what's been measured when they measure time reversal in phase conjugate optics you implode the lasers you need a super dielectric uh barium strontium titanate and that enables the charge distribution the super dielectric where the implosion of optics happens and that's the pine cone kissing nose it's called phase conjugation the first place time reversal was ever measured in modern physics phase conjugate optics there were some interesting limitations when they called it time reversal they actually only meant neg entropy they observed you could not time reverse clean steel back to rusted steel doesn't work you could only time reverse rusted steel back to its increased order previous state. In other words, time reversal was only neg entropy in those original measurements. You could only return to increased order and not decreased. Think about that for a minute. The other thing about, let me talk about the portal for a minute now. We became a bit famous because, you know, Jean-Charles Moyen, um, Elena Denon's friend, a Canadian, uh, he was repeatedly teleporting with witnesses returned from the beach in his more than lucid teleporting dream with sand between his toes, multiple times with witnesses. So we helped him to measure that. And uh, that's why we were in, invited to speak with Elena Denon at tours at the big conference, because we did measure that. So what flameandmind.com, what we did is we showed that just at the moment he began to teleport very specifically, there was an incredibly coherent, high amplitude, alpha to gamma cascade in his brain waves. They're off the charts, amplitude of brain coherence. Alpha uh, way out there, got to turn the gain down. Golden ratio and octave cascade up to gamma. So his brain waves were profoundly imploding measurably just before he teleported replicably with witnesses. Now that tells you something. 
you get that implosive compression spinning down into the nodes of the longitudinal array, and that array enables propagation distribution. But remember, almost every time he did that originally, he came and went to the beach. <laughs> Where is the longitudinal array most enabled? What does this tell you about the physics? Like why they used Ophane and Minokian to make the movie Stargate. My uh, partner at where when I found a guy at TV, Rick Hassan, made films, this Stargate. So they used the Ophane and Minokian alphabet because that was the shadow angles of the hypercube of the plasma to implode to enable implosion into the longitudinal array. The same reason Jodie Foster had to use a dodeca to enable a lucid dream called contact, which actually was. <laughs> so there are many limitations here. Just basically, the, the most valuable stargates are where there's massive symmetric array into the phase conjugate cube. For example, the, the trapezium in Orion is a giant vortex cube. And it's the biggest stargate in this galaxy and the subject of the of this Orion Wars for sure. In fact, that's how Anu originally got sucked into the Draco marriage that brought Enlil Yahweh to this solar system. Oh shit, because he wanted to own that. So the Orion Wars are all about the Stargate because of the trapezium cube there, cube there making the vortex, biggest star. So the war is always over the Stargate. For example, Uru Asa Elam, Jerusalem means Uru, ancient dragon, Stargate, dragon blood, Stargate. Asa means queen of, El means the pace, place of the phase shift. Make the L as an Elohim, which is from transversal longitudinal Uru Asel of Jerusalem. It's the Stargate. Oh, why is the war over the Stargate? Maybe somebody should tell them the Stargate's broken. Perhaps we should cancel the war. So the, the physics of this kind of propagation of Stargates, Elena does a lot of uh, teleporting, and she's very clear that there are hazards to this. You feel a little dizzy. In fact, uh, Swaru, we believe, did way too much time travel and completely fractionated the soul, ended up as an AI, and it was bad news, man, because the fractionation of the soul requires fractality in the time, whereas when you have these Stargates portal working in a disorganized way, for example, Montauk, the Templars were clear. They spent many years trying to fix the fabric of time, restore the, the fractality and the fabric of time. That's the Templar agenda. How did that mess start? <laughs> you know, Montauk. So, you know, time travel has its pluses and minuses, and there's a lot of literature on this, but it starts with the physics of how a vortex implodes into the longitudinal array, the only physics of action at a distance. About 25 to 30 years ago, I went on some adventure to this little town and I didn't have any money on me and I hitchhiked for the first time. I wish I knew some of this information because as I was walking back and this was 25, 30 years ago and nobody was picking me up and it was springtime and I was in shorts and a t-shirt, I had a, a dress shirt on and it was getting cold. I was actually trying to teletransport back to my yard I was thinking about you know my yard and my dog and like I was trying to physically transport myself I ended up having to sleep in a straw house so there were some hay bales I made a straw house to keep me warm and stuff so obviously I wasn't able to physically transport but what about you know communication like between people without having you know, words, right? Where you, you think, do you think we at some point, there was a lot of that maybe that went on before we started to use words to divide us the way, you know, it has these days? Yeah, to, to comment on the previous thought, I, I love I love it. The, John Charles was quite clear the first couple of times he teleported because he was yearning for his girlfriend. <laughs> and uh, so the Sufis say charge the battery of yearning, the opposite of what Buddha said. <laughs> but it is yearning that sets the direction. That's a beautiful story. So, but back to telepathy. Remember, so when Karatkov and Kozirev documented the physics of telepathy required the longitudinal nodes. By the way, healing at a distance requires to be best requires sender and receiver to be at the longitudinal cross point the sacred site literally and also like agnihotra works best at sunrise and sunset when the birds sing that's because of the longitudinal array so the longitudinal array is everything that has to do with telepathy because that's where dna is radio dna radio is enabled because the compression at the these nodes is literally the form of instantaneous communication in fact scalar longitudinal interferometry is how uh uh, Hartmut Mueller invented global instantaneous wireless communication before he got screwed up with his investors. But instantaneous global communication is by definition that longitudinal array. 
So remember, advanced cultures consider communication that is not telepathy to be very crude, actually. And having had, I had very limited telepathic communication with uh, an Andromedan, for example. And, uh, you know, you realize you be, as you become more and more tuned in as your eyes are closed and you see these images forming inside your head that you're communicating at a bandwidth, at a frequency, at an information density, which is much higher than you're used to. So only stillness enables that kind. And the ultimate form of stillness is the icy cold stillness of the longitudinal array. The same thing I felt when I hopped in the sarcophagus in the king's chamber, you know, close my eyes. <laughs> so it's that icy cold stillness where the nodes communicate most efficiently. And that's the physics of all telepathy. So when you become receptive and tune in, telepathy is profound and useful and beautiful, requires discipline and practice and absolutely necessary to evolve. What would you make of someone that, you know, um, did some kind of a drug induced, you know, psycho, uh, uh, well, what he, he took this thing called salvia and he went, his brother, I was a roommate of mine and he said he went to some other dimension and he was talking to some old wise elder, but they weren't using words and they were having this brilliant conversation and the guy told him he needed to go back and he didn't want to, I want to stay here. And he was fighting going back at the time. Maybe his trip was coming down, whatever it was. But once he came back, he was dead different and he's like some of his consciousness maybe got trapped in this other place and he was a totally different person he ended up going to the uh with a psych ward the mental hospital he left with a my pool cue and a pillow door open and left cops picked him up and then after that his parents had to pick him up and fly him back to vancouver and like he was I haven't heard of him again, but whatever happened in that experience, he said he was te telepathically talking to someone and he told him to go back and he fought coming back. So do you think his consciousness, maybe some of it got trapped there or because he was totally different after that? That's a very instructive story. Very instructive, very useful question. Uh, you know, my friend Ananda Bosman uh, in Norway, we did a lot of lectures of 30, 40 years ago, uh, was teaching Salvia Div Divinorum actually as one as one of the uh, acacia related uh, higher forms of the ancient Egyptians, and a very psychokinetic potential and having extreme astral hygiene challenges. So here's the the fundamental issue here, is that ultimately it's collapse implosion that enables the connection and enables the radio to work, and if that implosion is not self generated and is not symmetric, that is the beginning of holes in the aura. Literally the fractionation of the personality, literally the fractionation of memory. Now, obviously, if he, if he did this major trip and he didn't want to come back and only part of him came back, oh, shit, what a mess, you know? And soul retrieval is very, very, very difficult shamanic trick. This is not easy to pull that vortex back together. Humpty Dumpty, you know, you couldn't put all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't make an egg. I mean, a soul back together again, even though the Dracos manipulated the royal blood of Europe for a thousand years like show dogs, they still couldn't make a soul. <laughs> That's what Humpty Dumpty is about. So, yes, um, this is very instructive because, you know, sometimes a little bit of the psychoactive material in the right environment with shamanic discipline and guidance for people who are really stuck and can't have their own bliss experience yet. You know, with the right discipline, this can be helpful. But let me give you another example. My friend, Robert Archer, he ran the Santo Dime Ayahuasca Church in Sedona. And these guys were far more perceptive to astral entities. Oh, yes. However, they were far more afraid of them also. Why? Their aura was very, very porous. So only solid symmetry in the aura, self-induced implosion that's pure, precisely symmetrical. Otherwise, implosion can't do its job. The job of implosion, sometimes named bliss, is precisely toasting to parasites. So if, if you got beautiful bliss power inside you, you have access to your own regular source of bliss 
the beginning of not being a parasite, then obviously you're going to toast all the parasites, astral and stomach. All the parasites get toasted if you got real bliss. It's a fabulous, wonderful thing. It's really quite simple. At the center of that implosion, only the shareable wave survives. And that means everything parasitic is toasted. It's really quite simple. However, if that implosion is asymmetric, like big holes in the aura, and we suggest measurement, if your teenager comes and says, I want to try recreational drugs, get one of them GDV, uh, you know, Karatkos gizmos, and measure the holes in the auras and teach your kids about astral hygiene 101. <laughs> so this is why recreational drugs can be profoundly dangerous. Even ayahuasca, I believe, really, is literally because of holes in the aura. So look, Ensoulment is defined by how coherent and long wave the measure, the memory is. So when you leave part of yourself due to any kind of trauma, it's literally a piece of your soul. So when you were young and you had some trauma and you sealed off a little piece of memory, you got to go back and find that or a piece of yourself is gone. So contiguity of memory is the beginning of ensoulment. I heard a ophthalmologist talking to a seminar in front of a bunch of medical doctors, and he was saying, I'm going to put my natural path hat on. And he said that most physical ailments that the body creates is some kind of trauma stuck energy, mostly from childhood trauma. And that's stuck inside the body and it starts to manifest into something physical as trying to tell the body, hey, there's something here you got to deal with. And it starts to give it signs. And I was wondering, you know, it kind of relates to what you maybe were just exactly. talking about. Exactly. And, it, you know, you, you could hum a few bars from the famous song. Haven't got time for the pain. <laughs> so, so not having time for the pain means you don't have the courage to go back and retrieve the broken memory. So what happens at the moment of maximum pain is you literally check out of your body and then there's a chunk of memory missing. Unfortunately, with the chunk of memory missing goes a chunk of your soul. I mean, the coherence of memory is literally the symmetry of that implosion. So it's urgent, it's critical. You relax, do the therapy, whatever kind of therapy you like. Even therapy plasma is good for you know trans induction, but there's a million ways to do it. But you gotta go back Relax into it and see through that memory and feel every moment. And then you regain that power. Otherwise, your soul begins to unravel. Literally, it's real. It's necessary. Continuity of memory is everything. Reminds me of the saying that, you know, everybody should meditate at least 10 minutes a day. And if you don't have time, you better be doing it an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing, which is to enter the stillness and, and, you know, feel the continuity of memory and the bliss. Your aura is reassembled when you implode. Absolutely. I was in Thailand about seven years ago and I crashed a motorbike through a lawyer's office window and I broke my heel in two places. And so I was stuck on Koh Phan Yan, which is Full Moon Party Island. And I had met this shaman. He used to be in the U.S. military and he was out in Thailand and he had all his psychedelics and all these type of things. So I had tried DMT for the first and second time, the only two times I ever tried it. And when I went into the trip, the first thing that I saw were these Egyptian goddesses that were dancing seductively, that were trying to pull me into them, but they had snake tongues. And I uh, I felt like I shouldn't look at them. I shouldn't give them my energy. It's like they were trying to pull me into them. So I was, it was like the Medusa thing. Don't look, you're going to get turned to stone. So the first time I did it and the second time I did it, the exact same Egyptian goddesses were trying to pull me into them and that only lasted a few minutes and then the rest of the trip was beautiful i had a dog from the beach that came and laid beside me i could see and feel his energy and his light like with my eyes closed i'm in this other world but i could see this the light and all the energy that was going around but i was just wondering what your thoughts on what these egyptian goddesses were that i felt were trying to pull me into them yeah probably there was some past life succumbing to addictive behavior, even around sexuality. Um, you know, the Kundalini is called a serpent <laughs> and Thoth is called a snake. <laughs> uh, it, you know, this is a snake of plasma that implodes up your tailbone through your spine and explodes growth into the high brain. 
and it's beautiful and powerful and evolutionary. But and after my 30 years of Kundalini, when I first started, I cried continuously for about three months. <laughs> Process every emotion you ever had until it's shareable, man. That's a lot of crying. <laughs> so what's happening is any tendency you have to fixate on um, leaking that energy before it reaches pure principle. Sexuality is one example that, you know, here's the explosion of growth of pure creativity up your tailbone. Now, if you haven't had the experience of fulfilling sexual process and you're in fact sus susceptible to temptation, you're always going to have a leak there. <laughs> So whatever form of temptation you haven't conquered in the last thousand lifetimes, it's going to come back. <laughs> and it, the serpent is a name for a plasma vortex that needs to be steered. And sexual energy is only one of them. But until you can steer it into a direction which serves the whole, everything else is basically temptation and leakage. <laughs> What about actual nighttime dreaming? Because obviously that's different than lucid dreaming. What do you think that is? And, you know, what is happening? Are we going into a different dimension and experiencing things? Because when I don't consume cannabis um, for long periods, I seem like my dreams get a lot more intense. But when I'm consuming cannabis on the regular, I don't really get those intense intense dreams that you're i'm actually being chased and running and like you know like there's all kinds of stuff that's happening in in these these dreams when i go to sleep when i'm not consuming much cannabis yeah the the theory well i think there's some research that there is a correlation between uh lots of cannabis and shortened attention span and that's documented particularly in young people i believe and uh shortened attention span has to do with the inability to hold a vortex to an implosion point sustainably, actually. And um, so I, I would suppose that uh, when your attention span is shorter, you know, the bright implosion is less. And then as the bright implosion starts to return when you're off cannabis for a while, uh, there's a tremendous pressure to be able to steer that tornado into something which is shareable and is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, depleting. So um, uh, we discussed the physics of dreaming, specifically the physics of the difference between regular dreaming and lucid dreaming in quite some depth in the lastfractalu.com, luciddreamteam.com. And what we said was a regular dream, you have the optical cortex is well known. That's a hologram. You're animating the holograms inside your own optical cortex and you're processing emotions, your day, getting ready for, very useful, very therapeutic, very necessary. And if you don't get deep, deep sleep, everybody gets grouchy as uh, Deanna Troy documented in Star Trek. So if you, you know, if you don't get that deep sleep to have your emotions processed with your dreaming, you're, you're in trouble, you get grouchy. Now, the difference between that and a lucid dream is literally density. So as you're you make this golden ratio cascade in your brain waves. You have some bliss experience. You get focused. You get centered. You're on the ley line, etc. Your plasma aura gets more dense, and that implosion in your aura enables coupling down to the center of the longitudinal array, the Planck array, and you can connect with the array, propagate your awareness longitudinally, and do what the Aboriginals dream song track dreaming line, and you you begin to lucid dream. So density. Literally, electrical density is the definition of the difference between dreaming and lucid dreaming. And it's interesting that that then predicts who has a soul and will take memory through death, able to reach that density. Because, you know, dozens of medical doctors have documented that they were out of their body during near-death experience. Medical doctors have proven they were out of their body. And what, what they found out is you can't go outside your body into a metal box. Hell no. It's because the plasma vortex inside your head ain't going to survive outside your head in an aluminum box. Hell no. So attention has very specific limitations. If you're in a forest, great. If you're in a metal building, there's going to be some problems. So that ability to know the difference between a dream and a lucid dream is the beginning of knowing how to propagate. 
a vortex into the longitudinal and using drugs. Drugs decrease the threshold of firing in the synapse means the optical cortex gets more fireflies, literally gains resolution. But the problem is that if that implosion is not symmetric, that is self-induced, ultimately the, the aura is going to start to get more holes, I suppose. Now, maybe it was about 25 years ago, I had fought a bunch of gangsters protecting this girl that they were trying to pimp out or whatever. And I got stabbed 12 times. And when I went into the hospital, I remember them uh, stitching up my head and then the doctor was sticking his finger into each one of my stab wounds because I had lost so much blood. They couldn't, uh, he had to check to make sure any metal was broken off. But I ended up seeing myself, I left my body and I saw my lifeless body on the table with all the doctors and nurses around me. And I ended up floating away, but I don't have, you know, like, like, any memories of what happened after I floated away from that. And someone said it was probably because of all the drugs that they had put into my body, the morphine and all these things. But, uh, you know, I did, I did end up coming back into my, my, my body. And, you know, I woke up the next day I was in the hospital room, the surgery was all done and everything. Right. But, um, why do you think that some people have more, specific you know near-death experiences where they're out communicating opposed to others that you know can leave their body but don't really have that profound um other side experience oh that is a wonderful question uh, i'm thinking of my father now uh, my father had a a three-day near-death experience when he was a teenager in a horrible car crash and he woke up thinking his brother was dead. And so he was literally kind of like dead for the two over two days. And that near-death experience was, I think, central to how my father had such incredible sense of perspective on all of life. Everyone loved him. Emotionally, he was so mature. He could always see and feel the big picture because of his near-death experience. I think this is related to what's called the lost art of resurrection. The Templars, for example, had a very specific way in fact, they used um, a, a certain series of, of uh, herbs to induce a, a two or three day near death experience. And this was called, Freddie Silver calls it, the lost art of resurrection. So near death experience properly done can be profoundly uh, gifting of context to your life. Because obviously you enter the still point, you enter the array and there's a collective unconscious and there's the ancestor memory. And if you can come back with memory from that, I mean, that is the essence of what was called initiation, whether it's the crocodile fat of the Egyptians or the near-death experience of the Templars lost out of resurrection. It's access to the context of that array and that memory. So that's beautiful that you have some of that memory. And, but I would think, in fact, that it could be profoundly useful to you to do some very disciplined, um, even hypnosis, et cetera, in order to uh, recover the lost segments of that memory, because that would be profoundly transformative, theoretically. You know, finish your near-death experience, because that was finish your your wiring into that array. And obviously, people who can have intense bliss experience, then they don't need to get dead in order to remember. You know, Daniel Brinkley did it with lightning, but there's lots of more fun ways to do it. <laughs> We interviewed Storm Whaling from the UK a few times, and he had gotten shot in the neck, and uh, he went to the the bar where his friends and he passed out there. They brought him to the hospital, and he was pronounced dead. And he woke up in the morgue, and he doesn't know how long nine hours after they had pronounced him dead. So we don't know how long he was actually dead for but he actually woke up in the morgue. So he has quite a profound, fascinating story. Um, and he, you know, to, to, to actually, could you imagine just, they thought you were dead and they you're out and they somehow he was able to come back to his body after he was pronounced dead. <laughs> you know, there's, I was re- reading recently an article about where lots of old sayings, old sayings came from. And one old saying, which is called saved by the bell. 
It turns out that in ancient times, like, you know, centuries ago, they actually did some trials and they dug up like, I don't know, many dozens of old caskets. And they found that like 20% of the buried caskets showed evidence of scratching inside that somebody woke up from the dead and they weren't really dead. So this was a tradition for probably centuries. They put a string inside the casket when they buried someone hooked to a bell on the surface. And there was somebody assigned there for the first week so that you could be saved by the bell. Actually, So it was very, very common for doctors to not really know what death was. This is this is not unusual. Save by the bell. So. So, yeah, I mean, you know, since we don't know what life is, really, we don't know what death is. If we could see the silver cord connecting. Speak, we, speaking, yeah. go ahead. speaking of saved by the bell. Um, apparently bells were everywhere. And after world war, I think too, even Germany destroyed all the bells. Some people said, if you sat inside a bell, a big giant bell, there would be some kind of healing and stuff. Do you think that there's, you know, something to this healing and bells and potentially why they went and destroyed, you know, places that did have bells all over earth? A good friend of ours, Don Conroe, called himself the gong master, and they were using ancient gongs, literally a sound bath. And if and they even studied where the curvature in the knee of the bell needed to be so that when it rang, it could be implosive. Now, if you take the, the grail cup, the golden spiral on the caduceus, and revolve that in 3D, goldenmean.info slash grail, you literally get the ancient 3D fractal grail cup, which is a perfect bell. Uh, so indeed, it is about the perfect bell. It, another way of saying that is, you know, the Sufis in the uh, Gurdjieff's meetings with remarkable men, who was the saint? There was a test. The test was, who could make an echo? <laughs> the perfect bell? The, the, the saint was the one who could make the perfect echo. They're in this huge valley, and who can make an echo here? That defined who's the saint. Well, you know what survives death? The perfect echo, the perfect bell. We got a question here from Ryan in our Facebook. How would Dan define free will versus destiny from electrical implosion perspective? Yeah, that's the right question. So we are saying that the more implosive your aura, measurement measurable in the power spectrum, if it's harmonic inclusive, the longest wave there is going to tell you what's the biggest tornado you're embedded in. And that's the longest wave you can steer, means the biggest perspective you have. So your leverage literally is what is the longest wave of memory you can hold in your aura. The surfers of the Zavuya ride the long wave Uncle Joe. So the ability, what we call free will, is the ability to prehend a longer and longer wave which means we need, we must have long memory. Aboriginals knew that. And even the Draco who lost soul and were conscious that they lost long memory. And you know, now that Elena Danan has defined how Anu got tricked into marrying a Draco and how Enlil Yahweh got born half Draco <laughs> when they came from other galaxies. They owned seven galaxies, the Anak Empire. I mean, that's a big story. <laughs> and that's long memory. We now know how the largest plasma parasite in the solar system, E-N-K-I-L, literally the Grim Reaper, we know how he got here. This is long memory. So until we get our ET history assembled in our consciousness, we ain't got long memory. That means the free will is limited. Free will is literally the longest wave that you can steer. I actually saw the Grim Reaper on when I was on mushrooms. We were in this bar called the Castle, and uh, um, someone that I was with for the first time, I used to work with them, went out with for the first time. We were on mushrooms together, and right beside me popped out this like figure looking like the Grim Reaper with the hood, and I swung to try to knock it out. Almost knocked out the guys that were standing beside me. But a little later, that guy, he tried to kill me that night. 
And I was thinking it was kind of a warning. Whatever I saw, the guy tried to run it. He was on mushrooms and he was in his car and he tried to run me down. I had to jump over a fence because it was in a small alleyway. And I was just thinking that that whatever figure that I saw was maybe warning me about this guy's craziness and maybe his ill intentions towards me. That's very, very uh, useful insight that you know, we call it Grim Reaper. I think uh, the movie Ghost and uh, Flatliners, they were very instructive in this regard as well. You know, the, the Grim Reaper would come to take, well, uh, what Anne Rice meant when she named the father of all vampires, E-N-K-I-L. Uh, remember that those who don't have a soul and no source of bliss, their only source of biologic charge is to eat the plasma of other beings, louche, actually. And on a grand scale, on an intercellular scale, that makes some of our ancestors, you know, the half Draco and Lil Yahweh. And, and she, she really studied that. Remember, the, the blood would freeze and crystallize, and the father all va of va all vampires literally became the largest plasma parasite in the solar system in the person of the grim reaper and there's some truth to that me metaphor even some that we call the ascended masters they were stuck in the astral from their gold powder addiction and they had to eat the plasma of others so if you the gold powder addiction is a prime example of not then having your own source of bliss and being condemned to be a parasite astral parasite Mindful Exposures, who said in an earlier comment, "Can I work for you, Dan?" was one of her uh, was one of her comments. Says, "Is Wim Hof doing that to some extent with some of his methods, endotoxin stave off?" We love Wim Hof. We we get in the ice cold mountain water from the irrigation canal to mountain regularly here. We love Wim Hof. He's our hero here. And it's true that your 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 aura toughens and you see that ice cold fresh mountain water is full of soul man and ancient voices. It's beautiful and powerful. But you want to be careful. You want to be sure you're warm enough before and after. But Wim Hof absolutely had a wonderful contribution. We're sure. And endotoxin stave off is just one part of that, that literally it strengthens your whole immune system. Absolutely. We love them. Someone that's as intellectual as you, I think this is a really good question. People are more in their headspace than in their heart space. And hence, people are easily controlled and manipulated because of that. Where does intuition lie on a spectrum for you to be in your intuitive state, you know, opposed to led by your brain and your mind? Well, I invented the term heart coherence, realheartcoherence.com, and we did it by spectrum and analyzing the EKG at the moment of love. <laughs> And we got a very coherent harmonic cascade. By the way, it was an octave-based cascade, uh, which the low frequencies of the heart are absolutely the drummer, which determine where the brain phase locks. The brain cannot begin to phase lock without a good drummer from the heart, for sure. Now, it's true. The heart harmonics are always octave-based, and the brain harmonics are octave and golden ratio implosion-based. So... The resultant cascade that goes from the head to the heart makes the aura bigger and bigger. But if you're stuck in your head and the center of gravity of the plasma cone cannot extend down to the heart, then there's a serious limitation in the size of your aura. And the size of your aura is everything because that's going to determine whether you can implode big stuff or only little stuff. <laughs> so you must have the heart cascade in phase with the brainwave cascade we, by the way, discovered fun ways to measure that. You know, when your lover says, well, your talking is not connected to your heart and you need to prove to your lover. Well, there's ways that you spectrum analyze the EKG and the EEG and you document the phase lock. And that's the new feature of flameandmind.com. We can measure the phase lock from the EKG to the EEG. It's fascinating, gorgeous, beautiful, and powerful. So you can prove to your lover that your heart is hooked to your head and it's real. So, but intuition is the size of the whole aura, which determines the size of the field that you can prehend or touch. So if your aura is stuck in your head and doesn't go down, then absolutely there's a serious limitation, which is why, you know, bliss and Kundalini and all that cool stuff will literally drive you nuts unless you learn how to ground. 
the book Earthing is absolutely essential for that and uh, plasma like therapy.net. Like that intuitive state, I feel like I thrive under pressure when things happen. I always just enable to intuitively know what to do. And to the point that I had this car that was, you know, kind of failing and I was hoping someone would bang into me so they could pay for the car. And three times I, someone was about to hit me and I just intuitively whoop, whoop, right away, consciously, intuitively, you think about not injuring yourself or doing the right thing even though i wanted them to hit me i couldn't my intuition took over and it just you know it, like i would have got my car paid for because these idiots did stupid things but intuitively i couldn't let that happen to myself but you know your intuition is cooking beautifully there and intuition is absolutely something we must tune get very relaxed, learn to hear and listen to your inner voice. Uh, for example, in my case, after my Kundalini for many years, I had still very little clairaudience, but I developed clair, I'm sorry, very little clairvoyance, but I developed significant clairaudience and often would hear ancestor voices and even the voices of dead people. So I understand the physics of clairaudience now, which is a big part of how intuition works. Tuning into those things is essential and powerful and beautiful. Now, when people call people like non-player characters, you know, or maybe sheep or zombies, do you think that they are not connected maybe to that heart space? They're just in that head space and they're the ones that are easily programmable? Or why do you think that some people are referred to as non-player characters? I mean, literally access to bliss, access to soul. There are many names for this thing, but this is actually the physics of DNA radio and the physics of soul. And people who are not able to connect with that inner voice, are not able to connect with their own source of bliss, eventually become disconnected. And those are the people that don't feel. You know, when 3,000 people died at once at 9-11, and they measure the change in capacitance at Princeton Newosphere Project, we know the physics of that. That now is, that's the longitudinal array at work. And if you're disconnected from that longitudinal array, you are a non-player, actually, and that's real. And that has everything to do with hygiene and whether you live in a sacred space or whether you're in an ugly metal building full of every bit of electrosmog on the planet. And now all our kids are with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and they don't have a prayer at getting their inner voice working. And that is a soulless culture. Uh, here we got a question. Is there a specific sound frequency that Dan would recommend to treat water with? I'm currently running 7.83 hertz, but do many, but do many in the 432 scale as well? We have very good examples in software. Fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. Basically, you take Planck times golden ratio, and that Harmonic cascade is pure implosion. It's how we drive all our tech, therify.net, quantify, piezofire.com, all these tech based on pure implosion. And you put that in water and you got magic. Absolutely. You can even see the table there of why 432 shows up more in the octave cascade uh, than 440 hertz. So the principle behind harmonic inclusiveness perfected is absolutely implosive charge collapse, plonkfire.com which on this planet is slightly modulated from a cascade from Planck to 7.29 Hertz, which is pure theoretical implosion to the actual Schumann on this planet, 7.83 Hertz. And that difference is exactly the difference between 50 Hertz theoretical perfection versus 53 Hertz, which is what we have measured in every pyramid. So we know how the pyramids are doing implosion. They got that 53 to 7.83 cascade going down to down to Planck. So we absolutely know how to make implosion in water. You can see this discussion, fractalfield.com slash implosion sound. If you want the software, which is incredibly powerful and incredibly cheap, at flameinmind.com, the app is called Flame in Sound, and you can generate those harmonic cascades. And they're in, in fact, that is for sure, by agreement, the world's most powerful bliss binaural beat implosion audio. Flame and Sound app at flameandmind.com. 
Um, Bark the Spark from our YouTube says they can put voices in your head so discernment is needed. What's your thoughts on the voice to skull, the Hannah, uh, the Havana effect? We were supposed to interview this lawyer, um, and he had to cancel because he feels he's been hit by the Havana syndrome and that, you know, he's somehow like he's been targeted and he's feeling ill right now. And he thinks it's frequencies that he's been targeted because he's speaking out as a lawyer. And I think he's got some evidence or something. I think, you know, many people have theories, but the ones that actually have evidence are the ones that are a little bit more dangerous to, you know, the system. And they kind of hit a lot harder. He should probably uh, sneak off to some secret cabin in the woods and see if things change. But, you know, just to, uh, well, one example, I uh, work with uh, Andrea Puharik before he began communicating with Enki Tom, which became the Star Trek movie uh, in the only planet of choice, uh, Phyllis Schlemmer. And how he start, started making phone calls to Enki Atun at the time, uh, Andrea Puharik, he was developing transducers for deaf people to hear using piezoelectric bone resonators at the ear. And what he tripped over was the physics of clairaudience, for sure. And on that occasion, it turns out that Enki, a very advanced uh, Tom, Atun, began communicating, because, and that's what actually became the movie Star Trek in Phyllis Schlemmer's book about how Andre Buharik taught, uh, what's his name, who wrote Star Trek. So, so um, that ability to connect with the, that voices in your head has everything to do with clear audience. Now, determining whether that's a good voice or a bad voice, <laughs> hello, uh, it, it is interferometry for sure. It's longitudinal interferometry. And if you're in a very synthetic metallic and electrosmog poison environment, chances are it's a bad voice actually. <laughs> But if you are in, in the middle of some beautiful nature, most likely you, the Schumann cascade of the earth is going to sort that for you if you regularly have a, access to your own bliss process. But if you're, you know, an electrosmog addict, well, then probably those voices are going to be messy. So that's the beginning of Astral Hygiene 101. <laughs> Candice from our Facebook says, Dan, do you offer software on anything other than Apple? Originally, our implosion sound software, Flame and Mind and Flame and Sound on the App Store from flameandmind.com, were only Apple iOS. However, now those implosion harmonics are offered as WAV files, WAV files able to be played on anything. <laughs> but currently, we're distributing that only to people who are actually using our hardware, which these are the original drivers for piezofire.com, uh, Quantify and uh, five vibes. So these are devices that use pure implosion sound, and we have many ways to de deliver those audio implosion drivers. More information at flameandmind.com. If you want to play, you can contact Patrick or me, contact info at flameandmind.com. But yes, now we have those audio drivers in WAV files. There's a whole library available, <laughs> so you don't need iOS. And we've got around 200 people watching live with us here on all our different platforms. Thank you so much for your contribution. Albert says, thank you, Jesse, for having Dan on. Very excellent topics discussed. You guys get us charged up. And it's a nice, nice compliment. Um, maybe you wanted to share what uh, is on your website, Pyramid Wireless PyramidWirelessPower.com, FlameInTheMind.com, and then GoldenMean.info that we've got uh, on the bottom. And I've been putting it through the through the comments throughout the, the, the interview as well. Well, so as we mentioned this evening, that studying how PyramidWirelessPower.com worked uh, is instructive because actually the same physics is not just the Atlantean fire crystal toy stone, but it is the physics of how bliss implodes your DNA, literally, exactly, by the same phonon implosive cascade. It's the same physics, so it's instructive. I, you'll see the pictures there at pyramidwireless.power.com. And then flameinmind.com is our brainwave spectrum analysis software. Lots of people can analyze your brainwaves. Nobody other than flameandmind.com can tell you if you got golden ratio in your brainwave cascade from alpha to gamma, which is the self-empowering implosion moment when, you know, kids see without their eyes and start to get clairvoyance. And by the way, Jean-Charles started to 
to teleport. So flameandmind.com is the world's most powerful brainwave biofeedback. And with audio cues there, you can teach your kids the turning point moment when they start to replicably make their own coherent alpha and then the cascade. If you can't make alpha, you can't start. And by the way, alpha is the Schumann. So that's flameandmind.com. That's clear. Goldenmean.info is just the original index of all our projects. Specifically, what's most there now is of the five books, my newest book, plankfire.com. P-L-A-N-C-K, fire, P-H-I-R-E, plankfire.com, which is purely science, very understandable, but pure principle science that the, the fire of Planck, the flame of Planck, is the generalized solution to implosive charge collapse, the only key to alchemy, the only key to all action at a distance, the cause of gravity, the cause of consciousness, the cause of life force, and the cause of all meg entropy is that charge, fractal charge collapse. So that's my newest book, plonkfire.com, which is in the top rank of books on wave mechanics on Kindle, actually, plonkfire.com, which is just now newly out in Spanish. So we have a lot going in our ongoing course series at fractalu.com, which is have gone a bit viral. So we're having a lot of fun. And our big new fourth international conference, South France, this fall, September 19, fractalfield.com slash 2024. Ryan Peake's got a good question here. There are many predictions of an upcoming singularity point. Does Dan have any thoughts on this and what it could look like? Well, I think the metaphor for that is what I call the physics of rapture. <laughs> you know, during the rapture, the guns will melt and you do not want to be the left behind. <laughs> Actually, there's some good physics there because when the longitudinal array of the axis of the solar equator and the uh, uh, galactic equator, when these equators line up and precess and nutate, they form what's called the erection of the Holy Cross. And that makes the spin densities conjugate, which is to say implode. That is the physics of rapture. That is the physics of what's called the photon cloud. It's those rotational alignments, which not only stabilize gravity, but literally make the compression, the spin density that enables humans to go into bliss. And if you ain't ready, you go nuts faster. If you are ready, you graduate and get a soul and learn how to inhabit stars. And that's how you grow up and graduate. So, you know, the, the singularity point, the bliss point, the, it was called the photon cloud. Uh, uh, there was a book by, um, it was called the, not just, The Erection of the Holy Cross was by Nick Fiorenza. But uh, th they call it the, the galactic superwave. That's the galactic superwave book talked about this on. So the interstellar dust literally lines up to create the compression moment. And the, the, at those conjugate perpendicular alignment points of the galaxy versus the solar system, the same way that sunrise and sunset makes Agni Hotra work and birds sing, that galactic alignment create that interstellar bliss event potential for humans to evolve. Alana says, we need this guy on for eight hours. You truly have a beautiful mind and it's amazing, you know, how, you know, well your memory, you know, is with all of what you've been learning and, and putting into your mind. Do you think that there's a capacity in the brain, um, you know, that you can only be full with so much that if you're putting new information in, some of the other stuff maybe gets stored or maybe gets forgotten about or is our brain an unlimited amount that you can remember you know in it well we suggest the more you have access to bliss experience that charge density defines information density that is the burning fountain dna radio so the more you can support bliss in my case you know 30 years of kundalini means i can talk fast whether i would mention one more thing here my ability to share this with you is my passion believing that this is probably my highest level of possible service. So you give me the privilege of believing that, you know, you offer me the highest possible way that I can serve. Remember when they taught how to live without food and for a major portion of your day, every day when you're learning to live without food by Jasmaheem, you need to be doing whatever it is you believe is your highest level of service. And I firmly believe that 
service is to teach to become a shareable wave. So I'm passionate about that and it's fun. So I consider it a privilege. Thank you very much. I've done a lot of fasting over the years. Um, just for Easter, did another three day water fast where I just did ginger and lemon tea was the only thing I drank for three days. Um, the body doesn't need as much food as we're putting into it. It seems like we're eating a lot more. Do you think that the more you eat, maybe the less life that you may have because your body is having to process so much, maybe unnecessary fuel for it? Well, that's right. And my lady friend would very much approve of your suggestion. <laughs> And, and it's true that if, if you eat spin dense life force in food, well, then it's very easy to turn that into a shareable wave. If you're eat, eating highly processed crap, man, you're in super big trouble. You got a lot of mucus and stuff. So no, fasting is a beautiful thing. M my excuse is I have a super fast metabolic rate, but still your point is very well taken. Thank you. Well, you look at definitely, you look definitely in, in well shaped, like, you know, you, you're, you know, looking really good. Thank um, you. So you're doing, you're doing something right. And I think the more someone has extra baggage, maybe the more they should be fasting and the more someone is slim, then maybe they could do juice fast. And I think it was even back to the Egyptian days where they didn't have processed food, where they didn't have so much toxic, genetically modified that we know of foods, um, that they would fast one weekend a month, that they were still incorporating a fast into their daily or monthly regimen, you know, knowing the importance of maybe cleaning out the mm -hmm. system so it doesn't, you know, get overburdened by, you know, potentially what, what the food doesn't enable to process so easy. Yes. And, and it, you know, the processed food is an example of a wave that's not yet shareable. Every time you eat a plant that it was harvested in pain or an animal, you have to deal with the karma of that pain. Absolutely. And another level to add to that, what you said is beautiful, is that every single thought you have, if you're thinking about the pure principle behind everything, there is lightning spin in that thought. But every time you think, well, I'm angry at this person and that person's an ass and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you spend the whole day being grouchy, that's slowing down your spin density. So imagine if you could think pure principle Eureka all day. <laughs> Is there anything that we didn't talk about here today that you maybe wanted to share before we start to wrap this up? No, I think we had great fun. This was really wonderful. Actually, the limitation for me is my voice. My voice is wearing out. So I, I have to say goodbye here shortly. But really, uh, Jesse, I think your questions are beautiful. Your intent is obviously beautiful. And you've had some amazing experiences yourself. And that ha helps reveal so many principles. So I, I'm really grateful. And let's both be the shareablewave.com. And I hope to see you again. I love that. And, you know, we'll definitely love to invite you back if that's something you'd be interested in, because the audience was definitely benefit. I definitely benefit and the universe benefited just by, you know, hearing your beautiful mind, you know, share it uh, in intellectually. And some of the words is, you know, uh, like you're very, um, you're very intellectual and scientific. So some of the words I've was trying to to comprehend but you know you definitely have a wonderful presentation and we appreciate all of your time and energy that you're able to spend here on the missing link thank you thank you remember we have the the serious science at plonkfire.com once we know why objects fall to the crown why anything becomes centripetal we can know what spirituality is and how soul forms in the aura so fractal implosion is the principle here so thank you thank you very much <laughs> Awesome. Well, may the source be with you and protection around you during this pivotal time in history. Knowledge is power. The more knowledge we all have collectively, the less power they have over us. So uh, may exactly. the source be with you all. Thank you, everybody, for all your likes, comments, hearts, shares, and stars. We appreciate all of your love and support, however that may be. May the source be with you all. And uh, thanks again, Brother Dan. This, this, this was wonderful. When you have bliss, you can steer. It's magic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome for one love one heart one life namaste everybody and if anybody ever asks again you know for you to put a breathing inhibitor on say no maske okay <laughs> bye, bye everyone bye namaste. Dan. Namaste. <laughs> thank you